amazing to think that it's nearly two years since Stephen Fry dominated all the news headlines when he simply upped and disappeared, amazing. performing with uh, Rick Mayall in Cellmates. The placards still bear his name, but tonight Stephen Fry's role as KGB super spy George Blake was once again taken by understudy Mark Anderson. The show opened six days ago. Here, Stephen Fry and Rick Mayall are in rehearsals. They're together in Wormwood Scrubs. Well, he's here Ooh. now. Hello. Nice yeah. to see you. Well, very nice to be yes. here. <laughs> Is everything all right now? I mean, you sort of seems a happy to be. bunny again. Mm, yes, I am. yes yeah, I am. Yes, yeah. I am. Well, it, what happened? Um, I, I was in this play, didn't you see it? It was carried <laughs> in the papers, and, no, uh, and I wasn't in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, it's so hard to say. I mean, um, no one's really, I don't think, a good uh, doctor for themselves in the simplest physical things, let alone more complex mental problems or whatever one wants to call them. Mm. And um, I'm probably the last person who can tell you what went wrong. Um, except that I was very unhappy and I didn't know what else to do apart from run away. And um, like anybody who runs away, the old cliches come tumbling out. You know, you take yourself with you. Mm. It doesn't matter where you are, you've got to sort it out eventually. Mm. Um, I don't know what one calls it, cry for help, something like that. I have to say that, I mean, one positive thing to come out of it was, was how much how the nation holds you in esteem, because it was oh, quite extraordinary. That was really touching, and, and, and I felt slightly guilty as if it had just been some gigantic crawling expedition for compliments, and <laughs> it was in order to boost <laughs> my, to let off my self-esteem. But um, uh, also another good thing that came out of it, I think, was, was uh, I mean, I got some ex astonishing letters and, and faxes and email and so on from mm. people during it, and... It just made me realise how common this is. I mean, it really is the most common thing in the world, mm. especially, it seems, amongst men, though women too, of course, obviously suffering, but men, for some reason, I suppose it's something to do with our sense of competition and our sense mm. of career and self-image uh, in our work, mm. um, which seems to be particularly strong for men with our testosterone and all other territorial mm. hormones and so on. It also shows how, how damn good chaps are at c covering stuff up that's going on inside. Yes. Because, I mean, we've never actually met in the flesh, though. We've interviewed a couple of mm. times, and, and we've watched you and seen you and he heard you on various programmes. And I would have thought, if anybody had it together, you know, it was Stephen Fry. Yes, yeah. I know. It's always the way. I mean, you, you try and tell people that you're shy or that you're insecure, and they won't believe you. Mm. Um, no one believes the other person is. It's like when you go into a party, you know, you may have overcome your childhood shyness as such, mm. but you still believe the other fellow's carrying a bigger club behind his back than, than the know. miserable cotton bud that you've got behind <laughs> yours, as it were. You know, everybody, you know, you think has found, it's as if, as if you, you had toothache one day when life and its problems were covered in school and everybody else knows an answer that somehow you missed, Absolutely. you know. Yeah. And everybody feels that, but they so, so rarely admit that they feel it because naturally when there's all the macho posturing that goes on and, and the jingling of our car keys and the, mm. all the things that make us feel as if we're grand and strong. And is that sort of it in terms of on-stage appearances? Have you just decided that you, well, you can't... I think duty for the time being. Yeah. It, would be, it would be madness on my part to expose myself to, to another kind of... And it would also be madness on the part of any theatrical producer, I suspect, yeah. if you can get the insurance, you know. And, and uh, you know, I certainly don't blame anybody. Who, who well, I wonder if you blame the critics a bit. I mean, I, I, was, I was reading... I was listening to Radio 4 this morning, and they were talking about the relaunch of uh, Martin Gare. Mm. Um, and... So, the leading actor uh, was, was interviewed and he said that they had their first night and they, they thought the previews were pretty good. They had the first night and everybody went back to the hotels, to the bars on a massive high. The audience had loved it, they loved it, they knew it had clicked and it had worked. Yeah. And then they got the first editions, which said it was crap. Yeah. Um, and we all know what's happened. The seatings have gone down to 60% and they've had to relaunch. Now, you could lay that fairly and squarely at the door of the critics, or you, I suppose you could say it's a rotten production, but either way, the critics had a, a major part to play in pulling it down. Do you, uh, you must blame them. No, I don't. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I, I think you know, part of it was certainly that, 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 that they did not be particularly well received critically and that I'd been upset by that, but I think what had upset me was the suspicion that it might be true. And mm. uh. I've, never, I've never thought critics were unnecessary or didn't have a function or a role to play and that, that they have every right to say they dislike something if they do and they can say it as savage as they like. My only point is that I would never want to be a critic myself. I'd never want to be someone who closed shows or stopped people working. I mean, it may be necessary, yeah. but I wouldn't want to do it, nor would I imagine any friend of mine would want to have, the, uh, as their career, um, mm. doing something like that. I, mm. I always picture um, St. Peter, you know, uh, when, when a critic dies and saying, so what did you do? God gave you two legs and an immortal and a bright promise and everything else. What did you do to with your life? Well, I looked at things that other people had made and said, that doesn't really work, does it? Mm. You know, I mean, what would St. Peter say? Mm. Get out! You know? <laughs> I mean, frankly, what a way to spend a life, yeah. you know, looking at things that other people have done and judging them. It seems to me to be an awful way to spend the very short span we have on this earth. Isn't there a nastier well, edge, though, to, 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 to many of the critics now? There they're they're in competition, aren't there, aren't they? To, to, to there is that. I mean, I think a lot of them say, with some justification, they try and like things. A lot of them take the offensive and say, you know, if we have a problem, it's that we're too nice and too supportive mm. and the quality isn't high enough. And, we should be more judgmental. I mean, 
you know, they may or may not be right. As I say, it's just nothing I would want to do. And I think there's also people always drag in this thing about the British character and its desire to pull people down a peg or two and all that mm. kind of stuff. And, and there may be some truth in that as well. Um, mm. I'm sure we've all suffered. I'm sure you've suffered. Oh. I mean, <laughs> anybody in the public eye does. Tell us about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and some people are better at coping in it than others. And, and I may have looked as if I was good at coping, but I think inside, but you, you know, part of me may be. Though I, I always think it must take, at some level, quite a lot of courage, actually, to say, that's it, I've had enough, and go. I, I still can't decide whether it was brave or immensely cowardly. I suppose mm. it was a, a bit of each, really. I mean, mm. uh, it was an impulsive thing. I mean, did you decide like that? Yes. Yeah. I just suddenly, one morning, just thought, I, I, I just knew that I couldn't, couldn't go on, couldn't carry on, and mm. wanted to, completely to disappear. Uh, very odd, I suppose, looking back on it, because pain, fortunately, is one of the blessed things about the human condition. It's not something that you can necessarily remember. I mean, you can remember that you were in yeah. pain, but you can't recall it. You know, yeah. I broke my arm when I was 11, and I know it was agony, but I, you can't, you know, you I can't can my arm you now can't and it's fine. Up, can you? Exactly. Yeah. And fortunately, I, I know that I was miserable and in despair then, but now I'm not, so... Yeah. Might as well be pleased with that. Yeah. Well, for, very fortunately, it's not it's not your career as a as a stage actor that uh, is 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 sort of the mainstay of your life. Because I mean, there's writing and there's film. In fact, you've just finished filming. Um, yes, we we, we, Wilde. Wilde. we wrapped as they say on on Wednesday. We we we'd been shooting. Yeah, and there you are. are. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> been very Oscarish. Yes. Yeah. Heavens. Fantastic clothes. They are okay. wonderful. I mean, apart from that, we, we, we did sort of two and a half months of shooting on this and, and just the experience of wearing these velvet jackets and <laughs> knee breeches and these marvellous hairdos mm. was so thrilling. Yeah. So he's a, a, always long been a great hero of mine. Yeah. And so to be him, however, oddly, you know, with lamps and all around you and everything was, was an extraordinary Well, you experience. enjoy the, you enjoy the, a neatly turned epigram, don't you? Certainly, absolutely. I mean, in your own personality, in your own life, you're, you're a bit Wildian. <laughs> it's very nice of you to say so. I mean, <laughs> some I think people he... will be insulted. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> no, no. I think it's the greatest comment you could pay anybody yeah. to me. He was yeah. a great, great man. I think, I, I, and I hope one of the things that the, the film shows is that he wasn't that sort of brittle, camp, destructive wit that some people seem to think he was. Mm. He's an immensely kind, gentle man, mm. really extraordinary, sweet-natured, generous person throughout his life. Very, really. Very, very. He never really made fun of individuals. He made fun of ideas and so on. Can you explain to me? I mean, he came unstuck because he's, he sued um, because he was described as well, effectively as being homosexual, which he was, uh, and he sued and lost. Yes. And then he went to, to trial and, and got jailed. Why did he sue? Why did he decide to, to take a man to court when he'd only really spoken the truth? Well, w what happened was that Wilde had this intense friendship with Lord Alfred Douglas, um, mm. known as Bosey, uh, who was a young man. Um, when, when he met him, uh, he was still at Oxford. Um, and Lord Alfred Douglas' his father, the Marquis of Queensbury, famous for his rules on boxing, mm -hmm. um, hated this friendship with, uh, that uh, his son Bosie had with Wilde and kept pursuing him and hounding him and eventually left an open card at the club saying that to Oscar Wilde posing as a sodomite. Mm -hmm. And it was really Lord Alfred who hated his father beyond anything. His father was a hideous, brutal man mm -hmm. and had shown no love whatsoever to Lord Alfred. He was not what we'd now call a very dysfunctional family that he came from. Yeah. And Bosey really hated his father more than he loved Oscar, more than anything. Indeed, Wilde himself said in a letter to Lord Alfred, you know, that you, your whole life has been one of hatred, and hatred destroys everything around it except itself. And I think that's a very perceptive remark about hatred. And, um, and I think it was really because Bosey pushed Wilde into doing it. Oh, All of Wilde's friends said, don't, don't go anywhere near it. But Bosey said, no, you must, it's a public libel, we can get him, we can get him. Mm -hmm. And it never occurred to Wilde that, 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 this, that his homosexuality could be proved which it was because mm -hmm. Queensbury had detectives on his trail and also because a lot of witnesses lied. Um, and so the case against Queensbury collapsed and not only that, but it was apparent from the evidence that the Wild would be arrested. And then he made another extraordinary decision which was not to flee the country. And he was really given uh, quite a lot of grace in terms of time to do so. And indeed, uh, the joke went that all the, uh, the trains from Waterloo to Paris were stuffed with a better class of sodomite. <laughs> 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 running because it suddenly uh, it suddenly became apparent the police were, were you know were going to get nasty right. and um, yeah. so he stayed and, uh, and suffered price. two years hard labour which mm. was expected to kill in within nine months a man of his upbringing a man not used to hard labour at all but mm. he survived it just then went to Paris and died uh, in appalling circumstances. Well, <laughs> <laughs> nice. We look forward to the film. Yes, <laughs> is, it a is it a TV also, film or a, a no? It's for cinema. It's, it, it was a uh, big widescreen. Yeah. Yes. Now we're. We're looking back today, because it is Remembrance Day, um, and, and, and we've got a, um, a phone in about mm. memories of the war. And in fact, your book, Making History, does go back to the Second World War. And indeed and the first as well, in fact. Yes, right. I mean, there's a diary throughout it. Of, of, of but it involves a kind of time machine. Not exactly a machine, yes. I mean, it's one of those sort of leaps you have to make in this kind of book. But I've always been fascinated by the idea of changing history. I think it's partly being 
half Jewish and so on, and growing up with this knowledge of the Holocaust and the fact that a large number of my family, whom I will never meet. Yeah. And the basic idea is this history graduate who, who meets up with a physicist at the university, and they send a, a spermicidal pill, a male pill, into the water supply of the village of Brunau in, ah. in the 1880s in Austria, which is where Hitler was born, yeah. so that Hitler's father is sterilized a year before Hitler's birth, right. so, so that Hitler is not born. Yeah. Mm. Um, and immediately everything changes. The machine disappears at the moment it happens, and this young man finds himself, instead of being in England, in America, because yeah. his whole family history is different. And it's he's strange. in this new world, and he, yeah. he quickly experiments by asking someone about Hitler. No one's heard of Hitler, and he thinks, I've done it, I've done it. But in fact, the tragic irony is he discovers the world is actually worse mm. as a result of it. Partly through his own meddling, the irony is, because he sent this spermicidal pill into Austria in the 1880s, the uh, anti-Semitic movements in Germany throughout the 20s and 30s still came to a head, mm. and they used this extraordinary water in Brunau to mm. sterilize all the Jews uh, in no. Europe. So he, in fact, caused a worse situation. Yeah. Um, and and it, it speculates on the fact that we demonize Hitler quite rightly. He was an appalling demonic man, but that perhaps we let ourselves, or at least we let the generality of human um, history at the time, off the mm. hook. Because, you know, even in the 1890s, there were over 30 anti-Semitic yes. right-wing magazines in Vienna. Mm. And in, in, in Munich, when Hitler joined, you know, went to the first meeting of what became the Nazi Party, um, it was just the German Workers' Party at the time, before the word, na you know, the word National mm. Socialist was added. Yeah. Uh, th that was one of over 40 right-wing, Thulist, yeah. pan-German parties in Munich alone. So the world can't sort of pat itself on the back and say Hitler was an aberration? I don't think so. I mean, I may be wrong because we'll never know, but I think it's worth investigating. Yeah. And, and indeed, a lot of it goes into the First World War and Hitler in the First World War and so on. And, uh, um, and because, it, again, the First World War is something one can endlessly find fascinating and deeply moving. Mm. I think mar more moving than the Second World War, which was a question of Britain hauling up its slacks and getting on with its mm. job, mm -hmm. uh, as it were. But there's something so painful and shaming about what we did, you know, the, all the old cliches of cutting down a flower right. of a generation and so on, but they, they really are endlessly moving to me and I'm sure to everybody who, mm. who sees them. Well, it uh, sounds a, a fascinating idea. I should look forward to reading it at last. Making <laughs> history. <laughs> and you got it last night. I, well, I, I see the relevance now of these weird little sperm on the front. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> yes, there's <laughs> computer mice uh, as sperm, aren't they? Which is a sort of, um, Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. Once computers are around, you can invent all kinds of images. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, it's I good to see you back and in business and, and, and working. Well, and I'm happy absolutely, and all stay away from the stage. You know, why, why, why give yourself grief? You need to. Thank you. Don't need to be there. I will. Thank <laughs> 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 you, but. Your advice. All right, thank you. We're taking a, a break now. Coming up, we're talking to former ITN newsman Sandy Gall about his emotional return to Afghanistan and how to beat burglars. Crime busters Steve Watley, his dog, and Reg the Shed have got the answers. <laughs>